Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Mean Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Mean Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. I'm excited to talk to one of my mentors for gold and silver and mining stocks, also royalty companies. He's been covering gold and silver miners, gold and silver for many, many years. His newsletter, The Morgan Report, was one of the best ones over a long period of time covering junior mining stocks. I think like Pan American Silver and Silver Standard, where he covered them as juniors when they were well under a dollar and he rode them up in the past. He also has written, I think, three or four books on silver, just absolutely extensive, covering all the industrial demand, all the investment demand, uh, problems with GLD and SLV. He was one of the ones warning about that many, many years ago. His largest book is called The Silver Manifesto, and he has a new documentary coming out. David Morgan, thank you for joining me again. Well, thanks for the intro, Jason. It's great to be back with you. So, David, we're recording this interview on Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024. The gold price the last two months or so, two or three months, it's the rally's just been absolutely insane. The gold price, I think, briefly hit $2,300 today. It's a little bit down below that at around $2,280. Silver price is up over $26. Have you seen an environment like this before where demand out of, say, Asia and India, China and India is overwhelming outflows out of the GLD and the SLV before? I have not. <clears throat> What's very interesting is in today's world, as you well know, Jason, is that most of the stuff is not, uh, you know, some smart guy or smart gal looking at a chart or doing cash flows or whatever. They basically, it's all algorithms. And these algorithms work for the ETFs as much as they work for uh, the exchanges or a hedge fund manager or whomever. So what's interesting is you're seeing outflows from the GLD and the SLV in some cases, and yet you're seeing an increase in price. So normally, based on the algorithm, if gold's going up, you're going to see inflows into the GL. You're going to see inflows in the SLV. Now, there was about a seven, not quite seven million uh, ounce run into the uh, SLV today on a daily basis, but it's in and out. Basically, it's been drained. Well, that's just a drain, but a lot more outflow than in go. So this is unusual. And uh, there's an article that came out today by Ross Norman. I know Ross from, you know, the days in the UK and uh, don't know him well. But, you know, it goes through all this stuff and the institutional buying really isn't there. Um, the um, physical demand is on the in the West is is the opposite. I mean, I've talked to hedge fund managers and um wholesalers, and they've got inventory up the kazoo. I mean, they're sitting on stuff that they're they're having to buy back. The speculators really aren't there for anything unusual. If you look at this commitment of traders reports, which I have for years, um, there's nothing there particularly. I mean, you've got a pretty big uh, money managers on the silver side that are offside and, and could really get messed up if we get above 26 and close there like three or four days in a row, push out to 27. But it's not abnormal. It's not triple or double. It's just uh, on the high side. Uh, physical demand has talked about central banks we know have been buying, but they're not uh, doing anything super abnormal. And so we could put it on China, but that even with China, if you look at um, Gold Charts R Us by friend Nick Laird in Australia, and you look at the latest data, they really haven't done anything out of their norm. And India is very price sensitive. They're probably the best gold buyers in the world. They're not buying now. The price is going to. So really, you know, we're looking at uh, the algorithms. Uh, what are they doing here? Well, they feed on momentum. And momo go mo. It's a, it's a, it's a pure missing out uh, algorithm-wise, as far as I can tell. I wish I had a better answer for you. I like to be really sure of, you know, anything I say, and it can. I mean, we, uh, you know, it's not all data. You don't have access to everything. I mean, quick example, I'll digress for just a second or two. But, you know, there is no published data for how much silver is used by the military. And it's pretty vast. So it's just buried in the industrial case. You know, what's used in electronics and soldering and semiconductors and all that. Well, that, that just kind of covers what's used by the you know, United States military. 
But back to you. So I don't have a really great answer other than no. The answer is no, I've not seen this uh, before. And, and it is uh, a bit of a head scratcher. I think this is Keynesian economics. It's getting uh, knocked around, uh, proving that Keynesian economics, it's inaccurate with free market analysis and how markets actually worked. Uh, a lot of them have a deflation bias. They're deflationistas. I was speaking to a hedge fund manager a couple of months ago. It was right around when gold was below 2000 and it looked like the chart was going to crash. So it was like late November or December. And he told me that he was opening up a commodity short hedge fund. So right at the bottom, <laughs> right before gold started to rally, he said he was bragging that, oh, I'm going to raise all this capital and I'm going to short the shit out of commodities commodities, especially gold and silver. I'm going to make a lot of money and copper and stuff like that. And it was literally right at the bottom. David, I, I think this is definitely Chinese demand because I speak to some money managers. I follow them on Twitter and they're posting like screenshots of bullion dealers in China, like Shanghai and the top online ones in mainland China. We're seeing like huge premiums for some of the physical metal out of mainland China. I mean, people are buying They're, I think, worried about a Chinese yuan devaluation and other problems in the Chinese economy because they could potentially start quantitative easing and debt monetization soon. Yeah, I agree. I'll add on to that a little heavier than I than I mentioned when I spoke initially. I mean, uh, there is this big spread on, on the metals. And uh, there's a guy, I think he goes by Ghost something on Twitter. I follow him pretty closely. And he puts in what the spread is between the Shanghai Exchange and what's in London and New York. And it is quite significant. In fact, even Ross Norman says at the end of his article here that uh, quite possibly it is a combination of Chinese and official sectors buying from other routes, coupled in some cases with mounting uncertainty over the U.S. debt and its manageability. If so, this could be regarded as extremely high quality buying that is likely not to be reversed. And this rally is strong and has legs to go. So I think that's probably a pretty good summation of what you and I pretty much agree on. It's not surprising. I mean, gold should be far higher than it is relative to the amount of debt instruments that have been produced over the last two decades. I was on another podcast, and let me digress for a moment, Jason. You may may not believe this, but um, there's a very easy way to figure out the theoretical dollars per dollar price of gold. You take uh, the base money supply by the ounces of gold that Treasury purportedly have, and you have dollars per ounce. Well, if you did that in the year 2003, it was $2,500 an ounce. If you do it today, it's a factor of nine times higher. Why? Because in the last two decades, we've increased the base money supply ninefold. That's why the number is nine times higher. And so we're not even close to having a cover ratio of one to one for you know paper on you know paper equaling gold. I'll go back and digress a bit more. You probably know this for a quick history lesson. When if you did that same arithmetic back in 1980, the cover ratio with the base money supply in gold was 400 the ounce. Yet we hit 850 on the spot market January 21st, 1980 which was a cover ratio of two to one. So you could have, in theory, gone back to 100% gold standard after Nixon had temporarily closed the gold window August 15, 1971, and gone back on it. If you locked the price, you could lock it at 800, you could lock it at 400. But of course, that wasn't going to happen. We all know why. But nonetheless, I just want to point out that um, you know, $2,000, $2,200 gold, I'm happy for it. I've got a profit in real terms. But... Um, it nowhere near reflects the amount of debt uh, that's taken place over the last 20 years. Yeah, I agree. And the gold price in U.S. dollars has not kept pace with the consumer price index. In inflation-adjusted terms, it should be at least 2500 now, considering all the monetary inflation that was created just in, from 2020, 2020 to 2022. So only in about two or three years, the global... Uh, Global governments and central banks created many, many trillions of new currency units. It was over six trillion. So that uh, that means the gold price uh, inflation adjusted just to keep pace with CPI should be at least twenty five hundred now. Yeah, it's quite fascinating. 
Well, also, let me add to with the Chinese gold price, I think before the gold rally started here in U.S. dollars, so I think it was November, December, there was a huge discrepancy in the price. So there was arbitrage potential because the dollar gold price was below $2,000 an ounce and China, it, it was around $2,200. So there was almost a $200 an ounce differential at one point, but that spread has narrowed a lot in the last couple of months. Yeah, I've talked about that and i've gone to you know my best sources and you know i don't have a lot in china although i did have a, a few but most of that stuff when it gets that big an r if you think you'd actually get physical moving i'm not saying there isn't any but it's mostly done synthetically and it usually calms down as you just said well i mean this time though david the the dollar gold price actually went up to correspond to that. So we had a big rally. So all those Keynesian hedge fund managers a couple months ago that were bragging how easy the shorting gold, shorting silver was going to be, that gold was going back to 1700 or something because what the dollar was going to rally and interest rates were high. So gold, there's no reason to own gold because interest rates are higher and the dollar's rallying, right? So that's right. like the narrative for like the Keynesian hedge fund manager that believes that inflation is dead. Yeah, exactly. No, so, gold is just starting. I mean, I'm convinced that we're finally in the third leg up. The third leg up is usually the strongest as far as price appreciation. And duration-wise, it's usually short relative to the second leg up. So, you know, we started this in you know 2000. We got 252 gold. And we made some pretty big rallies. We got to 2000 back in 2011, September. And now we are broken through. 2000 seems to be support, not resistance anymore. And so we could go from two to four to six to eight. Who knows? Um, it's very difficult to forecast a paper price of gold because in truth, it's infinity. Because if the dollar reaches its intrinsic value, which is zero, then with that denominator, you've got an infinite you know, price. Of course, I'm being a bit facetious just to make my point, which is it's really hard to put a price on gold because once the frenzy starts, and the feeding of the sharks come in, where all the algorithms are nothing but buy, like N NVIDIA or you know Bitcoin or one of these things, and it's actually gold, where people realize that's their last message of hope to preserve their wealth. I mean, this thing could go in the, as Mike Maloney and others say, the unobtainium. I don't think it's ever going to be really unobtainium, but it's going to get to unobtainium for the average middle class. So when gold passes, pick a number, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, I don't know the number, but at some point it's going to be, I can't afford to buy it. I wish I could, and I've only got you know 10 grand in my bank account. I'm going to move into silver because it's a lot cheaper than gold. And so that's what happened late in the move in the 1970s into 1980. There was a lot of people that kind of looked down on silver once gold started moving past that 500, 550 level, they moved into silver. Silver's moving faster. And so it's like the altcoin market. There's some altcoin out there moving faster than Bitcoin. And now with today's you know, technology, all you have to do is ask Siri or uh, Alexa, hey, what's the fastest moving cryptocurrency today? They'll tell you the answer. And now uh, you just put a bid on that. So it's, it's a wackadoodle world. I mean, I'm very, very concerned as I've been, but more so than ever, because to me, as uh, Rafi Barber calls it, the end game is nigh. I really don't think we have a whole lot longer to go based on the acceleration of the debt, the decrease in tax receipts, the commercial real estate market imploding, and basically the uh, attitude on a moral basis of well, why should I work? I can buy Bitcoin and retire in my basement. There's also a supply and demand issue for U.S. Treasuries because foreigners like China, Germany, Japan are not large net buyers. And the both political parties, Congress, the White House here in D.C., they don't do not want to cut spending. So as we were talking before we started recording, the budget deficits are still blowing out. But I think that's an interesting point you brought up about silver. We're going to need higher prices of gold. We're going to need gold prices at twenty five hundred or higher for for years. Or silver above thirty five dollars to bring for the incentive, and it can't stay there for for a couple months. It has to stay there probably for a couple of years for the incentive to bring on new supply. You're absolutely right, and I'll repeat what I did on a pre podcast. But you know, people gripe about silver in a can. I mean, it did outperform gold in the seventies market. I think it will outperform in this market. 
But regardless, one thing that people don't really know, very few people know, is that when silver was hitting its all-time high in 1979, the price was $6 an ounce. When it was a year later, it went at 850% in one year. So think about that. Nine times almost in one year from 6 to 5250 was the actual high print. But then here's my point. When it fell back, the average price for silver for the year, he said it has to be a couple of years. I agree with you, Jason, was $20 the ounce. So if you go to 79, it was over 300% higher than the all-time high it had been the year before for the entire year. And you're right. That's what we need. We need silver at, you know, all things being equal in a constant dollar, which we obviously we don't have. But you would need round numbers like a $50 silver price sustainable for these miners, for copper miners, for silver miners, for a lot of these commodities to really put the effort, the capital, the labor, the permitting, all this hucky puck that goes into developing something that's capital intensive as something that we need to live. If you can't grow it, you got to mine it. And all these people with their, you know, smarter phones and dumber phones and all this stuff that, uh, you know, I'm no hypocrite. I have, you know, two cell phones. I've got uh, two screens on my computer, blah, blah. Point being, I can't grow it. You got to mine it. And so you could be as green as you want in anti-mining. But if you're green and anti-mining, uh, go ahead and get out your plastic bicycle, which is built on oil, and ride it around for a while. Well, the CEO of Glencore said in their recent conference call, another copper experts in an interview said they're basically not going to bring online any new sizable amounts of copper supply unless co- copper prices stay at $5 a pound or $6 a pound for a sustained period of time. They said we're ra- waiting for higher prices first. And as you and me know, because our, if our listeners have read the Silver Manifesto or any of your other excellent books, most of the annual silver supply is byproduct, especially from copper mines. There has to be an incentive first before the new supply comes online. And we're not going to see that yet. Exactly. Yeah, 25% of the silver supply is a result of copper mine. So, yeah, we are in, uh, again, to repeat, the end time, you know, end game. The uh, situation is disheartening from a commodity perspective. And, you know, you're starting to see this, the softs or the, or the ags go. I mean, uh, you've seen uh, cocoa <laughs> blast out, cattle blasting out. Coffee, you've too. Some of the wheat, whatever. So this is need. I mean, the thing about commodity is it's a need. It's not a want. And, you know, you need the metals. You need agriculture products. You need cotton. I mean, you could probably get by without cocoa, but all the chocolate addicts would probably have a fit, coffee, et cetera. So those are good precursors to the real economy. And the real economy has is, is been suppressed from the algorithmic trading that takes place in the futures market, which doesn't have a lot of bearing on the, on the real economy until it does. And I want that point to be emphasized, as you just said, and I'll repeat back, Jason, till it does. I'm not going to build a copper mine. I got one of the best copper projects on the planet, but until we get to $6 sustainable, I'm not going to waste, I'm not going to take the risk. And that's what's going to happen again and again and again. So there's going to be this gap where I think we're going into a greater depression globally. It will be, it won't be everybody equally poor everywhere but it'll be a decrease in standard of living, generally speaking, globally. And until we can really get on a more stable system where we know what a dollar or a yen or a you know, a currency unit is, <clears throat> until we have some stability and faith in the system again, I think we're going to see a, a further slide based on the proliferate spending going on in the Washington District of Criminals and elsewhere. That's funny. You're using district of criminals now. So by uh, greater depression, you're not talking about like deflation for a long period of time. Then you mean that there's going to be what uh, Fed distortions, government distortions, and there's going to be what stagflation? Because I think you're the one who said years ago that the longer Keynesian economics is employed, the more central planning is done, the more stagflation we're going to get. Yeah, all inflation is in and deflation eventually. But no, for... I won't say as far as I can see, but I would say for the next few years, probably 
massive stagflation. I mean, you'll see what people will refer to as deflation in some areas because of lower prices. Um, but generally speaking, things you need are going to cost more and things you don't need, you know, like the latest TV might be less expensive than it was when it was first manufactured, that type of thing. But the real problem is, is when it costs you, the average middle class working person can barely feed themselves and not have the luxury of going out to eat once in a while. I mean, even this McDonald's thing, I'm not a big McDonald's fan, believe me. But even there, I think the prices are insane. Uh, so this can cannot go on much longer. People just can't afford it. And so what happens is you get a contraction uh, in the economy because there's going to be less fast food buying because you just can't afford it. Yeah, there's substitution. People are trading down. But in the higher end, I think like some of the higher end stuff is doing well because those people have less consumer debt more less variable debt with like credit card debt or student loan debt. And they they benefited from the cancel on effect and all this asset price inflation of home prices and stocks and other assets for decades. True. Uh, I agree. But there's the finer point I want you to bring up. I'll give it back to you. But that's the commercial real estate is much to where shape the most people even uh, pretend. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you see all the office buildings and people working from their homes and this is an oversupply of an order of magnitude greater than you saw during the uh, 1990s when you had the Resolution Trust Corporation uh, basically bid off all this uh, real estate problems that happened in, when I was a young man, which was years ago. I'm just doing a comparison here that that was a real problem at that time. The one we're facing now is at least 10 or 100 times worse. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's the worst one in 100 years since the 1920s. A lot of people who don't study history don't realize that the Empire State Building actually went unfinished for years during that um, skyscraper and commercial real estate bust, boom and bust. Yeah. And there was a technology bubble, too, prior to the uh, October 1929 crash. There was a tech, tech bubble in radio stocks. So there's a lot of similarities for the six to 12 months prior to the October 1929 crash to then and now. Exactly. Well said. I want to ask you about premiums uh, for bullion dealers. So uh, I've been getting trolled on on uh, online by a lot of uh, U.S. and Canadian bullion dealers lately telling me that they have a lot of inventory they can't sell. Uh, Western investors aren't buying. But we just discussed the demand picture for China. And I think in the silver prices in China, they're selling at twenty nine dollars an ounce. So they're they're substantially higher, around three dollars an ounce higher for price differential. For my listeners out there, how do they tell when the premiums, when is a good time to buy gold or silver coins or bars for premiums? Yeah, that's a good question. It's one that really is a bit nuanced, not that much, but there's really two silver markets or precious metals markets. There's the retail market and then there's the market. So when I say the silver market, I'm referring to the commercial bar market that has thousand ounce bars either out of New York or the LBMA or now Shanghai. That's the silver market. Same thing with the gold market. You're talking kilo gold or 100 ounce gold bars. So the retail market is a separate market. Um, not that you can't melt, you know, silver eagles into a thousand ounce bar. You could. Or take a thousand ounce bar, take it to Sunshine Minting. I've seen the pallets have been to that mint facility several times in my life, and they're just pallet after pallet, thousand ounce bars that get put in the smelter and turned into, you know, silver coins eventually. I mean, they extrude it. There's a lot to the process. So coming back on point, you really want to watch the premiums yourself. And we are a wash in product, uh, especially on the silver side right now. A lot of people are fed up and burnt out on the silver market and they paid very high premiums. And they either took a loss uh, or they broke an even or close to it. And they just don't want anything to do with silver anymore. And this is uh, giving a lot of inventory back into the wholesaler's hands. So you really want to just watch the market. I mean, I um, do put out a few dealers that I know and trust and who I buy from on my free, free email list. All of my paid people, almost, they should all know who, who to buy from and who to store with based on you know my knowledge base. I used to put out a little electronic pamphlet on the best dealers and I quit doing it because I got so much trolling it wasn't worth it because 
a lot of these guys would come back and say I was wrong because Tolving is selling for less than you know my three recommended dealers. Yeah, he was, but he went out of business again. And he had be done before. So I knew these things that others didn't know due to my interest in the market, my age, and my experience. And this was, you know, valuable, I thought, to let people know. So now I just basically do it on a one-off basis with either my premium service or my free letter uh, and updates because <clears throat> it's not worth uh, the effort. But I mean, I'm probably a bit long-winded, but really got to watch these premiums. I said. These premiums are too high. You should wait. But very few people did. And now they're stuck with, you know, silver being about the same price it is now or maybe a buck or two higher with, a, you know, $6 premium on top of the uh, spot price, which is a huge premium. And now they're back down. In fact, I went into my regular coin dealer here in Spokane, which is a pretty good sized dealer. I mean, the whole city of Spokane was built on on silver coming out of the Silver Valley of hour and a half drive from downtown Spokane. And he said, I'll get you all the silver rounds you want for 50 cents over. Is that one of the lowest premiums you paid in a long time? Yes, it is. Yeah. I mean, online, I think I've seen some, a dollar maybe for some, for yeah. some of the um, coins and not silver Eagles, obviously, but um, right. for maybe some of the rounds, I think I've seen very, very low premiums. Um, for gold, I've seen low premiums. I've been tracking this stuff. I don't think there's a website that tracks all the premiums with the differentials falling. But I mean, from the trolling that I've get, been getting from U.S. and Canadian bullion dealers, I mean, they're stuck with a lot of inventory and they're sitting on a lot of losses right now because Western investors are not buying metal. Um, some of them are, I mean, if they waited, but a, a lot of people are not buying a lot of metal right now. It seems they're chasing what, Bitcoin or NVIDIA, artificial intelligence stocks, they're chasing whatever in the stock market's going up uh, out of FOMO and trying to get rich quick. Exactly. In fact, to go a step further, he also said that uh, they're, you know, bidding back on, you know, silver rounds or most silver products. I mean, I don't think they're selling for less than, or giving you less than spot for a silver eagle, but uh, and he brought it to my attention because in his shop, it very rarely happens. I mean, almost always you're going to get spot for, you know, platinum, gold, or silver as a minimum. But uh, it's not always true. And this is one of those times that just to reinforce what you said, that when the market's flooded on the wholesaler side, um, they got to wholesale it out. and They're not going to take a loss. So they're going to bid the same thing that they get from the wholesaler. So if the wholesaler is bidding, uh, I don't know, pick a number, 50 cents on their spot, that's what they're going to give you if you walk in with a silver round. Well, silver's at 26. Yeah, well, I'll give you 25.50. Take it or leave it. That's interesting. So you think there's going to be a lot of bankruptcies potentially then for some of these um, retail bullion dealers that are sitting on a lot of inventory and overpaid and can't sell the metal for larger premiums then? Well, I didn't go that far, but yeah, I think there will be. I mean, if you look at Basel Three, basically what happened was it basically took a lot of um, people that were marginal in the gold trade off off the books. They just left. And I'm not. It's not worth it. I, why should I, you know, eke out a living, run into a couple of gold desks at these banks when I've got these new rules and to be enforced? It's just not worth it. I'm done. So I think the same thing's going to take on the re retail side, which is a different aspect of a market. And yeah, you're going to see less and less um, mom and pops, and you're going to see consolidations. And even the big boys that use uh, carry costs, so they're paying, what, 5% interest or something to carry inventory. That really hurts. So you're going to see, I think, a consolidation, definitely. Okay, so your advice then is that people should monitor the premiums and not go out and buy right away. Because a lot of people, when silver prices were going up a couple of years ago, 2020, 2021, and silver prices did rally, they were chasing premiums. They were paying, what, $6 an ounce for some of the silver eagles. They were paying high premiums for silver bars. So those people should not have went out and bought. They should have waited for the premiums to come down then. They should have. I mean, I don't want to, you know, bad mouth anyone. I'm too mature and, you know, it's not. Uh, being a critic is the easiest thing in the world. I mean, you know, a troll is uh, <clears throat> an easy thing to be. But there was the idea that we had a, like a silver shortage when 
remember, the silver market's 1,000-ounce bars. That's the market that sets the price. There wasn't a silver shortage. Yes, there could have been a great deal of tightness in the retail market. And that's, of course, what you know most silver investors think about, and that's how they buy. They're buying you know, one-ounce rounds, one-ounce coins, 10-ounce bars, 100-ounce bars, and kilo bars. And so that's the market that they're familiar with, and they get all this information. Well, if someone sets the price that's a high premium, more than normal, all the other dealers pretty much fall in line, even though it's not necessarily price fixing. You know, you get enough you know information off the internet, you can kind of say, you know, who's a big size dealer and who's trusted and who's got a premium. Well, if he gets that kind of premium, I'm going to get the same type of premium. So you have this big uh, gap between what the normal premium was, and especially in the silver market. And then you had this very iffy supply-demand situation with the Silver Eagle market from the U.S. Mint, and it kind of fed on itself. And I was trying to make sure that uh, you either waited or sold high premiums. And there, are, in fact, the last conversation I digress for a second was uh, the owner of this particular shop, I'll just keep mentioning here in Spokane, he said he was calling up his bigger clients and saying, hey, sell your eagles now and you know, buy rounds, and sp- you know, take that spread of eight or nine bucks. And he said he had one client that missed out on $200,000 because he didn't um, take his advice. And he goes, we never do that. He goes, we never call up clients to tell them when to sell. But it was just so obvious that that market wasn't going to stay that high for much longer that they were actually calling people and suggesting they take advantage of the spread between an eagle and, let's say, another government minted coin or a silver round. Interesting. So I want to transition now to mining companies, royalty companies, because you've been covering those excellently for many decades. You've had a lot of winners from juniors up to producers and royalty companies over the years. Are we in a situation now, despite higher metals prices with gold where it is, is there going to be a lot of new gold miners that are getting funded? Or do you think the gold miners are like the ones that are producing are going to be like, okay, we need to focus on profit margins, free cash flow, maintaining our balance sheet. And we're not going to be bringing new supply online for different reasons, mostly cost of capital. We do not want what ha- just happened to Argonaut Gold, where we build a mine and then all of a sudden the cost to build the mine are way more than we thought. And then we get in financial trouble and we have to sell a larger royalty to Franco Nevada. And then most of the, and then like the best new mine, Mangino from Argonaut Gold, ends up in the hands of Almos Gold for pennies on the dollar. Do you think that a lot of miners, because of what just happened with Argonaut Gold, are going to say we're not going to be doing this anytime soon unless gold prices go higher? Yes, I think it is the latter. What you just outlined. First of all, the CSG thing is a thorn in the side for a lot of these miners, and not that they don't want to be good stewards of the environment and all that, because they do. It's just that the it adds costs. So, you know, to get a PEA, a preliminary economic assessment for a mine, it might take, I don't know, make up a number, a year and a half, two years, it might add another year. So definitely you're going to see a squeeze where you're going to see producers with a margin uh, that will be coveted by value investors. And this will come to the fore as earnings come out. It's the stock market supposed to run on earnings. And when you're an equity investor, I don't care what the equity is, you're an owner of a business. And as an equity owner, you get to share in the profits of that business. And that's what di- where dividends come in. But the markets are so distorted now that you have very smart people saying, well, dividends don't matter. Profits don't matter. PEs don't matter. The only thing that matters is that the stock's going up, so it's going to keep going up. And that's how the algorithms are programmed. So anyway, back to your question. I do not see a big boom in the gold uh, mining industry uh, based on $2,500 gold or even $3,000 gold. I think at that level, you're going to see some serious uh, projects maybe move forward. But what you're going to see is a gap, in my opinion, where once you get to that $3,3500, you're going to see not really any serious you'll see some serious miners come to the fore what you will see is a bunch of penny stocks that really don't have any merit that promise the moon they'll flood the market and they'll be like the alt market in the um, crypto world 
where everybody's brother-in-law's aunt's cat owns a gold mine somewhere in the Himalayas that, you know, in, you know there's some new mining technique. So I would be very leery of uh, the end run uh, as gold goes into the stratosphere. And I don't see that next year. Uh, I don't see it this year. I see good move in gold this year. I hope to see silver above 30 and stay there. I still have my doubts it will do that this year. It will certainly do it by 2025. And then um, then you're going to get in that, you know, that hyper hyperbolic, parabolic, double parabolic, whatever it's going to be, uh, momentum move in, into the miners and into the metal itself. I really still believe, not because I'm stubborn, just because I know how these Keynesian experiments end up, and we are getting closer. I mean, we've already outlined some of the more important keys to Keynesian markets, not talking about gold, and that is this probably once in a hundred year real estate debacle, the inability to sell treasuries because people know outside of the U.S. that they're really not worth the paper they're printed on. So what are you going to do? You're going to keep monetizing the debt? You're going to keep diluting the the currency supply, it becomes worth less and less and less, yet people aren't getting big raises to keep up with what their food costs are. So we're in a mess. So the point you brought up about mining shares, uh, I keep getting questions. When are my mining stocks, gold miners, when are they going to go up? I think this is going to be the way that this is going to have to play out. So it's going to take a couple quarters, two, three, four quarters. You're going to have to see top and bottom line beats, earnings beats, and then the uh, bank analysts that cover these gold miners, and they're not going to cover all the gold miners, at least not yet. They're going to start to change the cash flow projections, and they're going to start to raise the share price targets. And then the institutional investors are going to start to allocate some of the capital then to gold mine stocks. So that's going to be playing out then. As long as metals prices stay at these levels or go higher in the next couple of quarters, I think that's how things are going to play out. That you're going to see a re-rating based on cash flow projections by the mining stock analysts at higher prices, and then based on the cash flow projections, higher cash flow projections, and earnings beats, top and bottom line stuff, then you're going to see the share price targets raised. And that will bring more capital, more investment into the sector. Well said. I mean, basically, you just outlined how the can slim system works from Investor's Business Daily. And uh, I'm a big fan of William O'Neill. Yeah, that's what will happen. I think that's the most likely. That's the most sure bet. And unfortunately, it's going to take longer than it could. But if you're smart as you know Jason Burrup, you will see that now. And one of the bigger Wall Street guys is uh, Drunken Miller, I think, came in and bought a fairly good amount of gold shares because they are the value play. The value play right now is gold, gold mining shares, because they are, in many instances, uh, in a pretty good free cash flow position, getting stronger by the day, and they're very overlooked. I mean, you have a lot of these majors selling right now at a stock price measured with sixteen fifty gold, and we're at twenty two hundred gold. What does that tell you? Do you think there's going to be mergers and acquisitions and a lot more then? Because then the producer is going to say, "Why should I spend?" all this extra capex building a new mine when I can go buy a producing mine for that discounted cash flow valuation that you just outlined? Yeah, it goes exactly with your previous question. Of course, that's what they'll do. I mean, why go to all the misery of meeting all the new ESG and everything else when you can buy gold in the ground already at a discount or close to it? And it's immediately accretive. It's cash flow. It's cash flow positive immediately. So you don't have to worry about hundreds of millions of dollars of extra construction bills and capex overruns. I mean, look at what's happened with with some of these miners. We just talked about Argonaut Gold, Greenstone. There's, I think, there was an extra two hundred million dollars. Hopefully, that mine is online in the next couple of months. But um, you know, there's just tons of case studies. You've been doing this way longer than me, David of where they think the mine's going to come online on time and on budget, and then it's not, and then it's, what, a one-asset miner, and then the miner's in trouble, and then, what, they're either selling the mine or they're selling a, a giant royalty or stream on it. Exactly. And you started a royalty company, so most people aren't aware of this. So you were actually going in there and buying some of the royalties for some of these distressed assets. So it's a good business there for when the miner does get in trouble building the mine. <laughs> Yeah, now the one we picked uh, to start with 
did uh, very well. It's done much better than projected. It's uh, it certainly helped out the business. Of course, we merged a few years ago, uh, several years now, really. And um, unfortunately, uh, one of the acquisitions that the new uh, company bought was a uh, on paper a good deal, but it's it's the mining business and. Uh, the area that it's in has got too many problems. I don't think it'll be a mine. So, you know, from a stock price performance aspect, it looked good for a while, but that's all it did. Uh, you know, buying assets, I mean, the streaming and royalty business is really a great business, but you need to do your homework. And this was not a streaming uh, asset, which is really contradictory to um the terms of the merger but i don't want to get too involved with you know personal <laughs> issues but uh we weren't out to buy mines we we're out to do royalties or streams well this happens with the smaller ones so the smaller ones buy one asset in production one or two uh cash flow assets in production if there's a problem then the royalty company they only have one or two assets cash flowing that's uh, it's not a diversified portfolio or the smaller royalty and streaming companies what they buy a package of these royalties and then so they market it, but the royalties may never be mines. Or if they are mines, it's 10, uh, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Yeah. When I got into it, there were a lot of people thinking like me that were doing these smaller boutique kind of streamers. And very few of them had the discipline that we had to find really, you know, assets that were worth buying. A lot of people were just buying, like you said, junk that uh, had, you know, contract but this thing would never be a mine so you're basically buying dirt and uh so that whole mini industry sort of blew up and ours was merged with a, a refiner that uh had some issues going forward but regardless of again personal issues uh we did it right we found value and bought value so uh you know i mean if i could go back in time i never would have done the merger and we would have a pretty good situation well, I mean, let me let me add to your points here. I've been subscribing to your newsletter for a, a long time, uh, back in I think 2008, and you were buying Wien precious metals back then. It was silver Wien, and you were buying it when it crashed during the 2008 financial crisis. Franco Nevada too. I mean, you were getting those shares for very very cheap. Absolutely. What I'd like to point out is if you bought them wrong, if you bought uh, Franco Nevada at the top in um, September 2011. The stock, I forget the number, but you'd have about a two and a half fold on your investment right now. So you'd have to have gold up to 5,000 to be equal to the share price of Franco Nevada. And it got hit with this thing in Panama. So if you buy the right shares, you can do better than buying gold. Now, you know, the trolls hit me, especially the coin dealers. And most of these guys are my friends. And I've always advocated buying the real metal first. So I'm more on their side than they are, they are on my side. But a fact is a fact. If you know what the hell you're doing, you can do better with shares than you can with the actual metal. But I do both. But the point is that, oh, gold always outperforms the shares. No, on aggregate, if you take a basket and you average it, then gold, you can outperform a, a basket of shares. But if you pick the right ones, you can outperform the metal. And I have. Silver wheat is the same thing. If you bought it at the top of the market when gold when silver's at 50, and now it's half that price. The share price is still above um, where it was at that day. Not by a lot, but it's still better than having held your silver and it's half what it was at the top. So, uh, you know, thank you well, for that compliment. But it is true. And this is why, um, you know, I mean, I get the trolling too, but they don't, people don't even know. I mean, most people that troll me never bought the Morgan Report, never even bought a newsletter, don't know what a true financial newsletter looks like. I mean, the industry's come become a social media frenzy. I mean, the last couple of summits, not necessarily all of them, but it's it's leaning this way. It's more like who's got the biggest social media following and they're going to follow someone with an altcoin or whatever or some, you know, fancy sounding mining name of some, you know, dirt in the middle of nowhere. Rather than, you know, when I got into the industry as a youngster and wasn't writing for a living, I mean, we honor these men and women for their intellect, for their insights, for their ability to see the future, for knowing what the economic basis of the physical economy was and what we could do about it. I mean, these things were, you know, we were sought after. 
But, you know, now it's sort of like who's the most popular and how many selfies they have on their social media page. Well, with the royalty and streaming companies, I would say there's been a huge phase shift in the last 15 years because back in 2008, 2009, what it was viewed as niche. So royalty and streaming companies, it was niche. Oh, it's not a real business model. Mining companies hated it. I mean, it's gone more mainstream now. And during the bear market, you had Franco Nevada, Wheaton Precious Metals, Royal Gold. They did tons of deals to save mining companies. They bought gold or silver streams on base metal mines. They grew enormously during the bear market. I mean, Franco shares at one point were up 7x. The underlying business with the, what the cash flows, the diversification, it grew enormously during the bear market. I mean, obviously, like the last 12 months, they've had the Cobra Panama news. I think all the bad news is priced in now. And I think the rest of the business the next couple of years, it still has some growth. Well, absolutely. Yeah, it does. But overall, though, my point, like out of the bear market, right? And there was a really long bear market. I think this is a point here that the average person doesn't understand that gold and silver bear market for the mining companies was absolutely brutal for seven or eight years. There was only, I think, four or five gold miners uh, or gold companies that actually the share price was up during the bear market. And three out of the five, other than I think Lundin Gold and uh, not Kirkland Lake Gold, Agnico Eagle, after they bought Kirkland Lake, got Fosterville and Detour Lake in it. Um, only the three other three companies that are up during the bear market were just Franco Nevada, Wheaton Precious Metals, and Royal Gold, and that was it. Yeah, and we had Kirkland before it got bought out, so we did about a 10 bagger on that, but people didn't want to buy it, even though I told them because all these other ones are so low and going lower. But you really want to find the strength in a in any market, but especially in a market that the overall trend is down, you've got to find those ones that aren't drowning, the ones that are still, you know, making laps in the pool. So, well, uh, well, actually, David, like in a bear market in that environment, like the royalty and streaming companies like Franco or Whedon or Royal Gold, they they all have cash and free cash flow. They can go do deals. So actually, that's like long term. That's good for them because they're the only ones with capital. So there's tons of bargains for them to do smart deals. Oh, yeah. I still have a loyal base. It's a lot smaller than it used to be. But no, there's people that follow. I mean, I used to, I probably had more hedge funds following my work than anybody else. And that's a guess. But, you know, I talked to these people and we used to just put out, I used to put out every month, uh, what were the best three stocks in, you know, high market caps that a fund manager could use. And uh, I quit doing it, but it was pretty easy to do the math. And a lot of them would just do that. They'd swap between royal franco wheaton maybe move into agnico if it was outperforming or stuff like that but um it's a good way to be conservative sleep well at night have a good position and i've always taught that you know i'm a niche i'm in uh, in resources really i mean we do more to gold and silver and half right now it's focused mostly our uranium picks i mean one of ours is up about i think almost 500 percent. another one that i held almost to the bottom it's up like 300%. Um, most of our speculations have done better than most other letters, but we don't really don't want to buy the Morgan report for speculations. You could, but it's not, it's such a tough game. But the point is that, yeah, this is those companies that have cash and finance good minds do really well. So if you're able to have some foresight and understand the business, then you can do really well. And we have. So. Yeah, and those are royalty and streaming companies as new uh, new cash flows come online. So the valuation starts to get repriced. You get a higher cash flow multiple, get more diversification. They increase dividends or share buybacks. Franco's done all those things. So has Weed and Precious Metals over the years. You bet. As we wrap up here, I want to get your thoughts on new silver deposits. So uh, I, I know you pay attention to silver. Are there a lot of good new silver deposits being found in Mexico or Argentina or Peru? And do you think that they're going to be online in the next couple of years if silver does go higher? Do you think that those projects are going to be delayed for years? Yeah, that's a tough one. I just wrote, there's one that I have in the speculative category. I mean, if it was priced properly, it'd probably be a 10 bagger within a minute or three, but it's not um, because it probably won't be developed this this um cycle but somebody will recognize it i mean somebody will pay probably fivefold what it is right now just to have the project it's a district play it's in mexico it was found by some of the best silver miners on the planet but no one hardly knows of it other than morgan report subscribers and they complain it's like dave 
stupid. You know, the stock hasn't done anything. In fact, on my last report, I've got like three companies similar to this one that I'm going to, you know, hold the you know hold the CEO's feet to the fire and give them the hard questions. But you know, when you got a district size play, you need a lot of money to drill it out. And what they do and stuff like that is they find the best of the best within the district, go for that and drill it to the point where they can, you know, put up a pilot plan or get it going, or maybe JV it off and get more money to further explore. But it's a tough business, but I do know of a few. But as far as any new ones out there, I'm sure there's one or two in the world somewhere. Boy, it's getting harder and harder to find them. And the chances of getting them permitted or whatever, because Mexico purportedly is not going to do any new open pit uh, situations. They probably will. I think it's more of a political move than anything else. But uh, it's getting harder and harder to find. And it's more and more needed. It's we talked offline before we started is, you know, how much electrical power are we going to need going forward? Not just for people that want, that are in the third world one that want to come into first world status as far as energy uses per capita, but just the first world energy use per capita probably doubling over the next decade or so. I mean, it's pretty insane what's going on with this go green because it's the least efficient method to uh, procure electrical power at present. And even though I'm not, you know, Mr. Oil, you've got to look at um, energy density and there's not too many things that you can put one gallon of liquid into a, a lawnmower and get the kind of energy efficiency you can out of a gallon of gas. I mean, that's just a fact. So um, there's a lot in our future, Jason, that most people don't think through because they want to do the right thing. They want to be environmentally correct. They want to feel that they're contributing their fair share, doing the right thing, their part and all that stuff. But very few have uh, what I'll call an engineering gut level, logical mind to look at the truth and realize that a lot of this green stuff is actually anti-green, even though they don't have the intestinal fortitude to look at it in an objective way and come to the conclusion that's obvious to those that can. Well, also artificial intelligence, data centers, Bitcoin mining, electric vehicle usage, all these things need cheap electricity. We put the cart before the horse. So I see all these uh, technology promoters saying, we're going to do all these things. And almost none of them are talking about we haven't invested in the uh, new uh, infrastructure and new cheap electricity. So the nuclear people are just starting to talk about nuclear power now. We didn't make the investments 10, 15, 20 years ago. Excuse me. We didn't make the investments 10, 15, 20 years ago in nuclear power that we should have because then we would already have the infrastructure in place for the cheap electricity for those new technologies. And now here we are. Things are in reverse the way they should be. Well, another thing which we should bring on your show is that I think it's 20 percent of the nuclear power in the United States have plants that are 50 years or older and they need to be decommissioned. So you've got an increased demand with a decrease in supply. And this is something that very few people are even aware of. So, I mean, we are sitting in a situation where, as I said earlier, the you know, unfortunately, the depression is probably a reality. Um, it's not going to be like the 30s. It'll be different, but it will be a lower standard of living pretty much across the board. And please tell my listeners as we wrap up about your new documentary. It's called SilverSunrise.tv. Really, it's I'm not going to talk too much in the documentary about the problem, although there will be... Um, some of that, especially for people that, excuse me, are not familiar with, you know, what the Keynesian model has done to the economic slash monetary system. But it, the underlying theme is breaking free from the stress, fear, and control of money. My belief since I started studying the topic at a very young age is that money is power, and those that have the money have the power. So you can buy senators and congress bidders and political systems. And, you know, you buy a lot of people, a lot of people will sell out. There isn't, uh, especially as the moral decline increases due to the basement of the currency, a lot of people with high integrity. So that's what the movie's about, is overcoming this. And that mostly has to do with what we're ending this on, which is, is power or <clears throat> and not monetary power, but electrical power. 
energy. So as a thought experiment, if everyone had, let's say, free energy or close to it, and as much as they wanted and no meter on, and were able to t- utilize that energy in any way, shape, or form they saw most fit, think of the change that would be available to everyone in the world. And uh, I go into that in this movie. There's a movie called The Lost Century by uh, Dr. Stephen Greer, who's pretty famous for all of his UFO stuff. But his Lost Century talks about UFOs slightly. But most of the movie has to do with suppressed uh, energy situations with automobiles, with uh, electricity, with the zero-point field, all this stuff that's been suppressed or bought out or people ended up with a lead ache to catch my drift because uh, they were ahead of the curve and these uh, power power people that owned the conventional sources of energy wanted these other ideas to be suppressed. So well, that will look, be in the Well, look at what happened to Nikola Tesla and J.P. Morgan and Thomas Edison, what they did to him. I mean, he ended up broken and penniless. Absolutely. Yep. Well, I so want to think- hope. I mean, I, you know, I'm a big believer in the human spirit. I mean, the main point of the of my life's work is basically put the money power back in the hands of the people and we could do it more or less overnight in theory if we got enough people to just buy silver because silver is needed for the technological age gold really isn't i mean gold could substitute for silver in many instances why pay 80 times the price to do the same thing that silver can do so if we held the silver you really could make the adage that he who owns the silver makes the rules, not he who owns the gold makes the rules. And the last point is monetary history. There's a really good point to be made that the gold standard really doesn't work. There's a series of papers on um, <clears throat> one of the gold sites talked about gold standard equals fiat in disguise. If you type that into Google or a search engine, you'll probably find it. Gold standard equals fiat in disguise. The whole gist of the argument is once you have a gold only standard, you have nothing to measure it by. You can only measure it by paper. Whereas if you have a bimetallic standard, you have to measure gold in terms of silver. Or a trimetallic standard, you have to measure gold in terms of silver and copper. And those are absolutely necessities in order to keep you on a metallic standard. So quite an interesting intellectual thought process. I was pretty much taken back when I read the article. I go, this guy really knows what he's talking about. I'd like to take credit for it, but I can't. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, the free market decided that gold was used for large transactions or for savings. Silver was used for smaller ones and like change was copper. So, I mean, the free market voted on that and then governments hijacked it and distorted it with what fractional reserve banking, bullion banking and legal tender laws. Exactly. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time today, David. I really enjoyed our discussion. I think my listeners are going to learn a lot about premiums in the bullion industry, the wholesale, and then also about mining stocks. I think there's a lot of opportunities there for the gold miners. I think we are going to see valuations re-rated in the coming quarters as long as metals prices don't crash. I agree. Thank you, Jason.